Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the 2016 Hack Summit. We're joined now by Greg Pollock, who's the founder and CEO of Code School, which provides continuing education for software developers through online presentations and interactive code challenges. He's also the founder of Starter Studio and NV Labs, and was the former CTO of Rails NV, Patch Software, and Absolute Healthcare Solutions. He graduated from Santa Clara University in 2000 with a BS in computer engineering, and he was honored as Florida's Florida Governor's Innovators <laughs> Under 40 Award in 2012. I've, I never, that, right, I've never heard somebody read my LinkedIn profile so completely and thoroughly. Great job. That was oh, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> I think our research team just literally pulled it off of LinkedIn. Well, anyway, so, okay. so Greg and I collaborate at Pluralsight. Pluralsight acquired uh, Code School, uh, I believe it was early this year, right? Yeah. And, uh, and well, Code School is helping millions of developers around the world learning how to code better. And Greg's got a great presentation today on the developer's path to winning. And so I'd like for everyone to get to know Greg a little bit first before his presentation. So Greg, maybe you can tell the audience a little bit about how you first got into programming and, and how that led to the transition to eventually becoming CEO of Code School. Well, sure, yeah. So I was always into coding. Actually, in high school, I thought I wanted to be a, a game programmer. Um, went sort of down that path. Um, got a computer engineering degree in college and a theater minor, so really big into theater, and um, you know went into game programming. Worked at a small company called uh, 3DO. It was around that time I started getting the itch of like trying to solve problems using code, and so I I tried to create a couple companies. I'd go and create a company, and then I'd fail, and then I'd go back and work for somebody else, and then I'd create another company and fail, and go and work for somebody else, and then um, started consulting, and then created Code School after many times failing. That's great. You know, I actually got into development for video games myself, too, back in the day. Oh, uh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So um, really in this talk that I'm going to give today, you know, I really took a good amount of time to think about, like, all the things I wish I would have known really coming out of college about the profession of being the developer. So, like, advice I wish people would have given me. Um, and, I, and I hope that even the experienced developers watching get some value out of that. That's great. So Greg, I'm going to give you camera control here. Feel free to take it away, and I'll be here the whole time. All right. So I've got a quick like 20 minute. It's probably 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. If you guys have any questions, I'll be going from this presentation into the questions. Feel free to upvote the different questions you want me to answer as we go through. So let me see if I can uh, share my screen, and we'll get to this little presentation that I've got. Does it look good? Uh, I'm going to assume. Moving now. I'll let you know. Is it going? Uh, I'm just seeing a black screen at this point. Oh, uh -oh. there we go. We got something. You got it? Yep, it looks good. All right. I mean, I don't have tons of data on the slides, so even if you can't see the slides, as long as you hear me, you get the gist of it. So let's go ahead and jump into it. I've got like 10 points of things that I wish I would have known as a developer from the get-go. Number one, and this is sort of the biggest thing, um, you know, as a develop as a developer coming out into the workspace. You know, college has taught you some stuff, but you don't know everything you need to know. You need real world experience. In order to get that, in order to really craft, you need to find a good mentor. Now, doing the work that we do in the creative industry, it's risky, right? You take risks and you hope that somebody has your back and the right kind of mentor has your back and is there to help you grow. Um, like, just do me a favor. Uh, think about a time when you've received effective guidance. Right. It could be a teacher, could be a boss, you know, you know, maybe the input they give you was hard to hear at first, but you knew they did it because they cared about you and it enables you to do some of your best work. Right. Well, we, we all want that, right? You know, if we're in a position doing the creative work we love, taking risks, we're hoping someone has our back and helping us thrive. Yet we're brought up in a society that often says, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. And we often care about, you know, a great deal about being likable, and we're afraid of how unlikable it might be if we're direct, and we make someone, you know, feel defensive by giving them direct input. So, how do we? What kind of guidance do we do we want, and what what should it feel like? And and also, what what's bad guidance look like? Well, there's this talk that Kim Scott gave. She's an ex Googler. She did this talk at CEO Summit where she brought up this sort of guidance graph. So what does this mean, right? Well, let's go through this. As you can see, you know, with this blue dot here, 
up in the left quadrant, somebody might give you really direct and clear feedback, so it's really clear, but they might not really care that much about you. I remember back, uh, I worked, one of the companies I worked for was mp3.com, and there was this guy there that I had to go to whenever I had to figure out the right Perl or the right you know, Linux script to write, and I remember very vividly having to go into his office, ask for help, and I could tell, I could just sense on him, he would turn around in his chair, and he'd take a big deep sigh because he saw me there and he just was just so irritated to be interrupted but he would give me the right guidance he was the only person i could go to but i hated going to him because he just didn't feel like he cared so that sort of sucked right so it gave me great clarity but made me feel like he didn't care in the bottom left quadrant here you have people who aren't very clear and don't care this is where you get you know the uh the bad bosses, you know, that in your life that don't care and they're not direct and maybe they're a little passive aggressive. That's not good either when it comes to giving guidance, right? In the bottom right quadrant, right, maybe you have people who care, but they're not clear. This is where you end up with people who are like against confrontation. They're just too nice. They don't want to hurt your feelings. And by not giving you that direct guidance, they're not helping you right, but they care about you, and they might try to take care of you too much. And what results from this, what I, sometimes what results from this is, you know, you getting invited into that boss's office, and they're telling you that, you know, I'm sorry, you're not good, you, you didn't do good, perform good enough, and we're gonna have to lay you off, and that comes as a surprise. Why does it come as a surprise? Because they weren't direct about what they needed you to do. Um, and that's, that's horrible, right? So we don't want that either. Really optimally, you want to try to get up in the top right, right? So what, is that, what does that look like, right? So really good, direct, and caring guidance is might be hard to hear, right? It might be difficult because you might have put a lot of work into something, um, but it comes from a good place because you've established this trust and it's clear. So you want to look for a mentor that can give you this clear and direct feedback, that can give you the time that you need to grow and thrive. And this out of college or really at any point in your career, you wanna make sure that you're getting in a position where you're with somebody that can take, give you the time to give direct and clear feedback so you can improve, so you can take risks and you can feel like you have someone has your back. All right, so that was the first point. Find a good mentor. Second, and this might seem obvious, surround yourself with craftsmen. As a developer, it's really, really important. And what's the first step down that road? I think it's finding a meetup in your area where you can hang out with other people that are passionate about the technology that you are. Um, when I moved to Orlando, you know, I went to the JavaScript meetup. I went to the .NET meetup. I went to the Cold Fusion meetup. Yeah, there was a Cold Fusion meetup. And I'm I'm almost ashamed to admit I have a Cold Fusion certification. Yep, I did it. Anyways, um, enough about that. But uh, I went to these meetups and I found all of these people who are passionate about the same technologies as I was. And really, when it comes down to it, you know, I said I found a new technology and I found Ruby at the time, and I started the Orlando Ruby Users Group. People often ask me, Greg, do you have a hard time finding talented people to hire? And I have to honestly tell them, you know, that really hasn't been a big problem. Why is that? Well, well, number one, it's because we care about people and we have an awesome culture and we pay people well and believe in hiring smart people, trusting them and getting out of the way. But number two, it's about being around other craftsmen. So all of like the most important key hires, the first like 10 developers that I hired as my consultancy crew, which was NB Labs, which eventually created Code School, they all came from people that I already knew in the community through the Orlando Ruby users group because these were people who cared so much about their craft. And I, you know, I, I already knew who the talented people were in town. So when people tell me, uh, you know, where do I find talented people? I say, get yourself to the users groups. Even if you're not technical yourself, you go to the users groups to find, you know, talented people. And if you yourself are a developer and you want to, you know, find that next career, the best place to go is also by surrounding yourself with these in these meetups. The best jobs are never advertised online. They're just not. 
the best jobs you can find are the ones where you know you know people at a company and you talk to them and you get to know these people and they get to know you and you tell them hey next time you guys have a job opening please keep me in mind and you follow up and maybe you get your dream job that way all right third thing you can do as a developer to win go to conferences again surround yourself this is all about surrounding yourself with as many smart people as you can here at code school we pay for all of our employees to go to one local conference and remote one remote conference a year just because we care so much about this, about you being passionate, about being a craftsman and improving your skills. And so um, this is a great way. I mean, it's probably worth going to conferences even if your company doesn't pay for it, just because you get to surround yourself with people who are passionate about the same things you are. Number four, learn to delegate. Um, this is straight out of one of my founder's talks. Um, in case you like what I'm saying, you want to learn more about my startup story, <laughs> Google Greg Pollock founder's talks, and you'll see uh, this, one of these things in here. So when I first started getting really interested in building a consultancy and building a well-rounded business, you know, after a couple failures, um, somebody sent me in the mail. Actually, I think it was, it was Derek Sivers, CD baby guy. Um, he sent me this book in the mail because he went to one of, our, one of my Rails tutorials um, and what, was, what I learned about this book is that creating a business is all comes down to systems, putting the right systems in place, right? So you have, you know, a marketing system, a development system, a design system, sales system, leadership system. And, you know, this is why people buy into franchises. And if you buy into a franchise when you create a business, it's more likely to succeed because all these different systems are documented. So all you have to do is follow the recipe and it's more likely your business will succeed. And your job, as you advance in your career, is to identify how these systems work best for you and your company, and look for ways to improve the system of the business, or the systems. Look for ways you can make it better, right? This could be realizing that, you know, if you force yourself to touch base with your clients or boss once a week and set expectations, everything works out smoother, right? I know, you know, I had to figure that out with my clients as I grew NB Labs a consultancy. All, there was tons of these administrative things that like I had to do as I got more and more clients. They were on my plate. I was the only person that really cared about getting them done properly. And, um, you know, uh, the emails, the phone calls. And after a while, I really, I really hated my life doing all of these administrative things. It was, it was rough. Then I realized about this time, there's these people that you can hire called project managers that are not only good at managing these sort of things, but they actually enjoy it. Mind blown. They actually enjoy these things. Um, and, you know, so I realized I could find these people and I could delegate scheduling meetings, writing expectations, invoicing organization to these project management people. Um, and that was, that was great. Um, so if you want, you know, uh, let me skip this slide, right? Um, as a developer, as an engineer, I often find myself, and especially in the early days, falling into this trap where if I, something's on my plate, I know I'm capable of doing it, so I shall do it because, well, deferring this to somebody else, that would just not be being accountable, right? Or make up some excuse. Um, but just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And let me let me go on to explain this a little bit further. Um, it comes down to doing the math. If you had 10 more hours of programming a week, right, what would that allow the company? What more money could the company bring in? How much more successful would the company be, for example? Um, I always like to bring up this idea. Um, Back, one of the office spaces that NB Labs had was working next to a company. And this company, a uh, tech company, had about 100 employee, employees. And one of those employees was a full-time barista. All they would do all day is make coffee for people, espresso and lattes. And it sounds lavish, right? We have our own barista. Until you start doing the math. Let's say you've got 80 people. 
They average one cup of coffee a day. Some are gonna have two cups, some are gonna have zero. So let's average it out to one cup of coffee a day. Having to get up from the desk, go to the elevator, walk to Starbucks, order your coffee, get back in the elevator, come back up, get back to your desk, get back in the zone. You know, or even, you know, going to the coffee machine and talking to people along the way and getting out of the zone. It's wasted time. There's at least 15 minutes wasted. On the other hand, if you could, you know, send a Slack message to the barista with what you want, and then it shows up on your desk, you know, five minutes later, how much time would that save? Well, if you do the math, you add this up on a daily basis, that's 1,200 minutes. That's 20 hours a day from what could be some really valuable people. Um, so when you do the math and you go, okay, we can hire a barista, you know, they're gonna, you know, have probably a lower end salary. Um, we pay them for eight hours a day. Well, we could actually be making money by hiring a barista. Holy crap. Do the math, right? So if there's something that you're doing that isn't working towards what you do best, keep an eye out for that. Now, you might be saying, I'm not running my own business. This has nothing to do with me. That's no excuse. Even if you're a cog, a small cog in a big machine, there are always ways that you can find to help the system run better. And the, system, the solution is not even, even hiring, hiring somebody. It could be just somebody that has a task better than you or really enjoys it. There's someone at your office that maybe really enjoys working with, you know, what's a good example? Payment systems. And they're really good with payment systems. When it comes time and you've got a payment system task on your plate, but also other high priority stuff, it could be the matter of saying, oh, hey, I remember that, you know, Nate really enjoys this sort of work and he's also better than me. So I'm gonna see if he wants to do this because it might be better. So it's as simple as that. All right, so that's delegation. Number five, stay out of your comfort zone. What do I mean by that? Well, after this conference or tomorrow, you're gonna wander and get back to your desk, wherever it is, and you're gonna have a series of tasks in front of you. Some are gonna be easy, some are gonna be difficult. The difficult ones, well, why are they difficult? They might be difficult because they're scary, maybe even risky. But at the end of the week, looking back, which task do you think you're gonna have the most potential to learn from? The risky ones, the hard ones, or the easy ones? Right, the answer is easy, right? More difficult tasks means more learning. These are the tasks that are outside of your comfort zone. These are the tasks that you're most likely going to grow from. But as human beings, we naturally gravitate towards the easy. A good example of this is the email trap, right? Why do people talk about email being a trap? Well, it's because it's chock full of nice, comfortable tasks that we can complete quickly and get that little shot of endorphins that give us a good feeling about what we're accomplishing, right? We naturally gravitate towards a safe task so we can feel quickly useful, so we can feel quickly accomplished, All right? All right, so you gotta be careful about that. If you wanna learn the most while you work to become the best craftsman, you have to stay out of your comfort zone and understand that it's the scariest and riskiest task that you will benefit the most from. And if you stay in your comfort zone and do the easy tasks, it's really bad. It can lead to stagnation. It can lead on decreasing like job satisfaction because you're not growing. So you really got to try to make sure that the tasks that you have in front of you challenge you. And if they don't, you got to figure out how to make them do, right? And that could mean, you know, rotating onto a different team. It could mean just simply innovating more. Maybe you're just doing the work that's handed to you without trying to improve the system. Maybe there's a tool that you could build to improve the system, and that might be challenging enough to keep you out of your comfort zone. All right, number six, eliminate distractions and get in the zone, right? People have different ways of achieving this, right? It could be, you know, getting some coffee, tea, headphones, noise canceling headphones, um, right? Um, the biggest thing 
you know, developers, craftsmen, we need long periods of focus time. And if you get interrupted, if you allow yourself to get interrupted by, you know, checking your email, pinging notifications, um, coworkers interrupting you too much, um, it's going to hurt your productivity. And that can also affect your job satisfaction. So I find that the biggest thing that I can do is turn off notifications. Slack is the worst for this. You know, I make sure on Slack, that I'm not checking it that often. I turn off all those things that pop up in the right-hand corner, so I'm not distracted by that. Um, I don't. I don't allow myself to have an email, you know, notification system. So you got to turn off your notifications. It's the worst thing for kicking yourself out of the zone. Also, I try to check my email like no more than twice a day. That can just be a suck. So maybe once in the morning, once at night, um, and some days I'll let it slide. Um, also, asynchronous communication is really important. Whenever you need to talk to somebody, you know, in the office, what I push myself to do is, you know, um, ask myself, um, how important is it that I talk to this person um, right this second, right? Is it important that I go over to their desk right now and tap them on the shoulder? Is this something I need today? Am I going to be kicking them out of the zone if I send them a direct Slack message and it automatically pops up. I'm not sure I want that either. So maybe I'll send them an email and they can so they can just get to it when they need to. So pushing yourself when it comes to inner office communication is, you know, to think about how disruptive does this need to be is really good. Um, also, alternative workspaces, I feel really help me stay in the zone. I mean, here at Code School, for example, um, I don't, the idea of having to work in an office five days a week is just not appealing to me. So why would I make other people do that? So here at Code School, we let people work from home on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I feel like on those days, um, I feel like I can get a lot done. So that really helps for me. Um, whatever works for you. It could be Post-its. Um, lately, I've been uh, I've moved from Post-its to Wonderlist. I love Wonderlist for setting priority. So I make sure if there's anything I need to do, I get it out of my mind and onto a list somewhere because you know I feel like my you know minds aren't meant for storage. I want my mind to spend as much time processing as possible, and I don't want to have to remember about the three things that I have to do, or to get the you know to pick up the dry cleaning on the way home. There's always stuff like Pomodoro, right, which allows you to have that focused amount of time and then take a break. Stuff like that really works. The other thing you have to embrace, of course, is that it's not natural to be productive 100% of the time as a developer. Like, it's just not natural to come to work and work for eight hours straight, right? <laughs> and so you kind of have to embrace and figure out what works best for you, what kind of breaks you've got to take. So I always tell people in code school here that, um, you know, 20% fun, 80% productive. That's great, right? So if you can 20% of the time, that's your time, you know, getting coffee and, you know, playing ping pong. We've got a you know, tradition around here, ping pong table. In fact, we just started a new uh, ping pong tournament this month. I am the reigning champion. A lot of pressure on me to to step up, I'm sure, to see if I can retain that championship. Um, but it's important to have fun and, and endorse that inside your environment. All right, number seven out of 10, right? I think I've got 10 in here. Um, <laughs> The most sophisticated solution is really the best solution, right? We as software developers are always tempted to use the latest technology and the most, you know, the most recent tools out there because we love experimenting. Um, so sometimes we over-engineer stuff and come up with an overly complex solutions to a simple problem. Biggest example to this, like Code School. At the beginning of Code School, uh, we were like, you know, we were a consultancy and we're like, yeah, we want to create lots of products. Let's go ahead and build a multi-tenant billing system separate from code school that way every product that we have we can uh, use this billing system so you only have to create it once and we'll make it so we can have multi-tenants different products do you know how many tenants that multi-tenant billing system ever have you'll never guess one just one and we over engineered this thing all to hell and back <sighs> right so we should have we should have just done a really simple and i see that all the time about you know developers over engineering the simple uh, over engineering which should be simple tasks and i'm afraid to say it but sometimes the best solution is in fact wordpress there i said it i got it out of the way all right 
Moving on. Uh, eight, take risks when you can afford to. I wish out of college somebody would have told me, don't get a job with a big name company. Try to find a job with the small, try to find like the smallest company possible and don't try to make a lot of money. Get equity, right? Immerse my, I wish somebody would have told me to go find a startup, right? Because when you don't have, you know, a spouse or kids to support, you don't have a lot of mouths to feed, that's the best time for you to take a risk. And there are actually ways as a um, developer in this world to make a good amount of money. But in order to do that, in order to like get some of that, you know, startup money, you've got to be willing to take risks, right? Maybe you have an idea or maybe you can find a startup with an idea you believe in. You know, work for dirt cheap plus equity, take a gamble with your time. It might not work out in the end, but you know, if you play your cards right, you might end with a few hundred thousand dollars in the bank by the time you're 30. And that's going to, that could possibly change the quality of life for the rest of your life. You know, Americans are traditionally really bad at saving for retirement. So I would say when you can, take the risks when you can afford to, which is usually towards the beginning of your career. Um, don't get sucked up into management if it's not your passion. As a developer, during the course of your career, you'll have many opportunities to take the lead, right? And if you don't tend to enjoy taking the lead, that is okay, right? You're going to feel like in order to graduate higher in you know, leadership, you're gonna have to start managing people, but this is truly false, right? Um, if you find yourself in a corporate structure that doesn't value craftsmanship, that doesn't let you advance as a senior craftsman, it may be time to look for another job. Um, a lot of companies, that's just what it looks like. You just have to go up into management to, to, to move your way forward, and that's just so bad. It should always be okay to stay a craftsman to be a senior developer that moves up, you know, I think in, in some of the bigger corporations, sometimes there's, you know, this called a, a fellow track, right? You don't have to become a vice president. Um, you don't have to move into management. If it's not your thing, if you're more of an introvert and you just want to be really awesome at coding, embrace that and follow a career path that allows you to stay as a senior developer. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Number 10, don't lose sight of the power of choice. And this is the last one. Often in life, you're going to end up in a situation where you feel you are stuck. You know, could sound something like this. I could get a better job, but that'd be too hard. I won't get paid enough. I'd have to move to another city. So I'm stuck. And as soon as choice, as soon as that choice becomes an illusion, that's when you end up feeling stuck. You end up feeling alone and you end up making choices. What happens when you, when you feel stuck? You end up making choices based on fear, right? So you're in that meeting tomorrow, right? And you hear somebody saying something you don't agree with, but, and you know there's a better way to do things, right? But you're afraid. You're afraid to speak up. It might make you feel look bad. And if you speak up too loudly, you know, you might not get that promotion. You might not, you might lose your job, right? Um, or maybe, you know, I have to do this project my boss put in front of me because, well, he put it in front of me and I really don't have a choice, right? But the fact of the matter is that you have that control. You are the one that decides to get up in the morning and go to work. You make all of your own decisions. If you stay at a job that makes you miserable, it's not because you're stuck there. It's because you choose to stay there and you don't care enough to change it. If you're wondering why you don't get that promotion you want, you have the power to discover why or why not. You have the power to choose and ask people what you need to do to get it. And even if they say it's going to be hard, you can choose to believe in yourself and try harder. If you want that one dream job at that one company, you can always try harder to make that happen. You're not stuck, right? Reminds me of this quote from one of my favorite uh, luminaries, 
<laughs> you have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes, you can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own and you know what you know and you are the guy who will decide where to go, right? So stay accountable for your choices, right? If you feel stuck, it's because you are choosing to feel stuck and you have you're the only you're the best one to figure out how to solve your own problems and that's 10 things i wish i would have known out of college and now i'm going to switch back and take some questions great thank you greg wonderful presentation that really resonated with me Thanks. and uh i think the audience has really been receptive over ch over chat to to a lot of the the concepts you presented today so i'm, I'm very curious to to get some of their questions addressed. Uh, the first question comes from Miroslav with 137 votes. Miroslav oh. asks, what makes the difference between a good programmer and a great programmer? Oh, cool. Um, I honestly, you know, my mind immediately goes to what I look for when we hire programmers, which is somebody who is a self-learner, right? Somebody who when I ask them, what do you do to stay on top of your technologies? What do you do to stay on top of what you, you know, of, of programming? And, you know, uh, so I think the difference between a good programmer and a great programmer is somebody who cares a lot about their craft and improving on their craft and knows that it's not a destination. Becoming a master programmer isn't a destination. Um, it's something you continuously strive for. Makes sense. I actually have a question for you myself, which is, um, so I've noticed that, uh, you know, in my life at least, I've heard advice um, and best practices all the time. And I noticed that um, sometimes uh, developers who hear advice like this will receive the advice, but they won't necessarily execute on the advice. The mm -hmm. idea that they'll actually know what to do Mm -hmm. but they won't actually do it. So the, idea, the, the concept of knowing versus being or knowing versus doing, why mm -hmm. do you think people don't do something? Why do you think they, they hear the advice but they don't actually act on it? <laughs> right, they obviously, they don't, uh, they don't think they have the control. They can't visualize the solution. Um, it's about taking the time to really reflect on what you want, setting your priorities and then setting incremental steps. It's one thing to think, yeah, I want that someday but it's hard to visualize the steps to get there. You know, it's like, you know, you're building a big project and you want to be able to engineer it like this. Like if you can put the same amount of effort that you would put into solving a coding problem or architecting an app, if you can take that same amount of planning and effort and think about putting that same amount of planning and effort into something you want to achieve, whether it's that job at that amazing company or, you know, stepping up into a new role at your company and then taking the time to think about the intermediary steps, right? So I think people are afraid because they're not taking the time to think about all of the small steps that it takes to get there because that task looks so daunting. But if they took the time to plan, maybe talk to a mentor, have lunch with a mentor, the best thing you can do also is like um, find that person that has your dream job job or that dream role, take them out to lunch and ask them, how did you get there? What can I do till I can eventually get into a role like yours? What are those incremental steps? How did you get there? So it's, it sounds like what you're saying here is that having the path more well-defined, broken out into to minor steps along the way can help you kind of visualize how to get to the finish line and it seems less daunting. Yeah, I think that's probably the best advice is breaking things down into smaller pieces and steps. Exactly. Yeah, I agree with that. In fact, I, I've noticed that people's happiness tends to be a function not of where they are today, but a function of the future that they're living into in the future. And if they mm -hmm. see that path and they're excited about that path, then they could be you know, in the worst situation possible for them today, but they mm -hmm. could be on top of the world excited because they know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel coming across and that having that plan to get there uh, I think is instrumental to get to, to being happy in that state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, totally. so let's go to the next audience question here. So um, this is from Ariel with 118 votes. How mm -hmm. has the acquisition by Pluralsight affected Code School's operations? Uh, we've become a lot more organized. <laughs> um, we've graduated to uh, having uh, less intuition uh, 
and guess guesswork to a more organized flow. Um, probably the biggest thing is there, there was a bunch of things that, well, first of all, I have to say, um, if you want to hear more about sort of the um, acquisition story and how it sort of came to be, um, like I mentioned a little bit in the talk, um, Google for my third founders talk. So search like Greg Pollock founders talk three. It's free. It's totally free. Um, and it goes through sort of the rationale leading up to the acquisition. But really, um, what we found in Pluralsight was a company that had very similar culture to Code School, but they were ahead of us by many years and went down the investor route, which we would have eventually gone down. Um, but um, now, you know, we knew when we got to that, you know, five million dollar in revenue mark that we were kind of lacking some of the experienced leadership that we probably needed to take the company from to like, you know to increase in revenue. And we saw Pluralsight, you know, we were either going to get investors that brought that knowledge on board or find a company that had those experienced um, people. And so we found in Pluralsight a lot of the mentorship that we kind of needed to become more organized, to really um, improve our operations. You know, for example, doing things like doing a, uh, setting yearly goals and setting quarterly goals and figuring out who's in charge of those and breaking those down into smaller steps. Like we didn't do that before. And uh, Pluralsight kind of showed us how they did it and taught us how to do those sort of things, um, which was really beneficial. So, um, and just, you know, Pluralsight's management style is just, it's just, it's the code school way and it's the Pluralsight way, um, which is really about, um, you know, it's not about, it's about creating that transparency and creating, you know, feeling like you're working on a level playing field where, you know, there's not directives coming down from on high. We're all on the same boat together and we all want to help each other out and we're all friends here. Um, and uh, so it's just been very trusting and very helpful. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. That's awesome to hear. So. Um, so another question from me here. So one of the tips you gave touched on the idea of notifications and Slack and how Slack, you know, can interrupt your flow as a programmer and flow is, flow is very important as a programmer. Mm -hmm. So we did a, a Slack poll yesterday where we asked people, uh, you know, do you worry if your colleagues see you as being unavailable on Slack? Are you worried what they'll think about you if you're not available on Slack, are you worried they'll think badly of you in some way? And, and actually a decent percentage of our audience honestly said, yes, they do feel that sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so how do you wrestle with that if the culture of the company is that everyone else is available through these instant alerts and notifications? Well, I think, I think you do need to be available um, if somebody's private messaging you or if somebody at names you. Like, I kind of feel like that is you should be expected to respond within 30 minutes, right? No matter what day, if it's during work hours, I think that's important. Um, so I kind of think you have to do that, but I do hope that, you know, uh, I know some people are, people are different than me and some people don't get distracted when they have notifications for every single channel that they're on. But I really hope people are, responsible enough to not let that get that kick them out of the zone and uh, you know only have notifications for when people are at messaging you okay great um, you know it's funny I was uh, I was helping out a company at pivotal labs a while ago and and I saw two developers sitting next to each other mm -hmm. and instead of tapping one developer tapping the other developer on the shoulder to ask a question mm -hmm. he sent that developer a slack message and then they the other developer slacked back. And they had this fairly lengthy dialogue over Slack when they were uh, literally next to each other on a table. Right. And then eventually they're like, you know, this is silly. Let's just have a conversation. And they took off their headphones and they oh, had a gosh. conversation. Is that is that what you think uh, a workforce, you know, a healthy workforce looks like? Like, what's your opinion of that? You know, like you're right next to someone. Should you send them a Slack message? What do you think? <laughs> well, if it's gonna be that disruptive, uh it kind of depends, you know. Sometimes Slack message, you know, if, if you're looking over and somebody's coding it in the zone, right, then tapping on the shoulder could certainly um, disrupt them, right? And if they're pretty, you know, if they're good at staying focused, seeing that there's something catching their attention, 
finishing their thought, then I can see like that initial Slack message. But I do think that that should immediately lead to an in-person conversation if they're sitting next to each other. But um, I've certainly been the culprit of that sometimes, especially when you work in an office environment where you know we try to discourage a lot of loud speaking in the work area. Makes sense. OK, and then uh, last, one last question from me about delegation here. So you're, you're totally hogging up all the questions here. No, I know. I'm being very selfish here. Um, <laughs> we'll get to the audience in just a second. I, uh -huh. I'm dying to ask this of you because I'm very curious. Because the delegation is very, you know, it's a topic that's near and dear to me. Sure. How do you decide what to delegate versus what not to delegate? Um, how do you decide what to delegate? Well, it really comes down to you know, um, thinking hard about even though I feel ownership over this task, am I truly the best one to do it? That and could this be a good learning experience for somebody else, right? So, you know, it's about it's about figuring out job roles. There's a lot to be said about job roles and figuring out, you know, what to do and how to delegate. And, you know, as you're, you know, as a entrepreneur, you start out wearing all the hats, right? You've got to do everything. You're in charge of everything. But then as your company grows, you know, hopefully what you find is you hire more and more um, domain experts, right? So that you can let go of the tasks that other people are better at than you are. At least that's the hope. Makes sense. OK, let's go back to the audience here. So with 97 votes, the next question is, why should I choose codeschool.com over teamtreehouse.com? Right. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I know a ton of people that use both really successfully to learn. Um, you know, if you're going to learn a programming language like really well and start building in it, you know, am I going to be able to hand you one textbook and like here, here's everything you need to learn? You're not going to learn that way. People use multiple resources to learn. So I think um, having a subscription to both can be a really great way to um, to 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 get yourself going because you're gonna you, you you're not you're gonna want to see things in different ways to really learn it. But that being said, um, Team Treehouse is usually where I send people when they're starting from ground zero. They do a really good job with the beginner. Whereas Code School, a lot of our courses, we try to make the voice of our courses still be accessible to beginners, but also more advanced developers who want to switch technologies. Right. So maybe they want to learn Angular, or they want to learn Backbone, or Node, or Rails. Um, our courses are kind of at this pace where if you're a really beginner developer, some of it might go over your head, in which case Team Treehouse might be more your pace. Um, so it's really, it's really learning styles and preferences and pace. Um, but you know, I think having a subscription to both could easily be a way to, to get yourself moving. Great. Thanks, Greg. So the next question with 61 votes. What do you think about mentoring as an alternative way of online education? Yeah, there's some really exciting um, sort of hybrid uh, programs out there that I um, I keep a close eye on. That are you know, Code School is you know self-guided learning, which is great. And then you've got on the opposite side of the spectrum, right? You have all the coding boot camps that have been popping up here and there. That you know you pay several thousand dollars to go through, which should be a great way to learn. Um, I think that's what I would do if I wanted to pick up a technology and I could find the time and the money. To, I would go through a boot camp. Um, and then there's all of these hybrid programs. You have block.io, B-L-O-C.io, and they've got a really good, it's like 500, 600, 700 dollars a month. And it's co combining sort of, it's in between code school and um, the boot camp experience with paired with mentoring. And you have Thinkful. And then recently, um, Flatiron School out of New York created something, uh, Learn.co, which is also in the same sort of style of you know self-guided, but also with mentorship. I think there's a lot to be said about mentorship. If you can afford to spend the time and you have the money, I think it can be really, really effective to have a mentor um, online. And of course, things like hack hands are great for that when you need a little extra help. Great, thank you. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know in the audience, there's a little bit of a bias here. I, I used to be the CEO <laughs> of Hack Hands, which Pluralsight acquired, and we did you know online mentoring for programmers. So Pluralsight, by the way, is, is rolling that into their courses right now. And so yeah, we can actually get on-demand mentoring at Pluralsight. 
Mm -hmm. So with 59 votes, the next question is from Alexi. And he asks, hey, are hey, you going five to minutes in? left? Let's do a lightning round and see how many we can do. Yeah. All right. You want to just run through them yourself? You can just do it if you can see them on your screen. Sure, sure. Are you going to introduce certificates like free code camp? Um, you know, I was that's interesting. Um, that's starting to get more interesting to me, definitely, the idea of certificates. I mean, a certificate as a developer, it's hard for me, like a certification in the developer community, it's like certifications are like, what do they what do they really mean that much? But I guess it like I'm starting to realize maybe there is some credibility to that. So who knows? Right now we don't have any plans for certificates, but the future, who knows what will happen. Um, if that's something you do want, please do let us know. Um, yeah, feel free to give us an email. The more people that are that are speak loudly about that or tweet at us, tweet at Code School, the more we hear about that, the more likely we are to create something like that. All right, and that's, that was from Alexi. Thank you, Alexi. Next up is Tony Archer. What amazing job with Code School. What, would, what can we as developers do to entice non-developers with great minds into our field? How can we get them over the initial learning curve? If only there was a way they could like learn by doing in the browser without having to configure anything. Um, that's Code School, right? So um, Code School has a ton of um, free courses. And you know, I feel like we try to keep it entertaining. So you know, the way you put that, right, I think uh, besides, you know, get them in front of a Code School course, just because it's this really self-guided, hints if you need to, gamified environment that is great. You know, that's what I've done with people that I thought about getting coding into, but other than code school, okay, other than code school, what can we do as developers to entice non-developers, the great minds into our field? That's a good question. We're doing a lot. I feel like um, things like code.org and the hour of code are doing a ton to spread the word. There's the tech hire initiative, which is good about spreading the word and showing people, finding people, uh, you know, how easy, how not how easy it is to code, because that's not the truth, is it? It's about getting people who have the skills and have the enjoyment of it, showing them that they can find a career. That was a, that was a crap answer, but I'm going to move on. Um, could you provide the summit attendees gift of code for a free month on Code School? Oh, you know, this is a good segue. Um, coming up on March 5th and 6th, we are doing a Code School free weekend. So basically what that means, that's March 5th and 6th, we open up all of our courses completely free over that weekend. So any courses you see up on there, we just released an Ember course. You wanna learn Ember, you wanna learn Angular. Um, so how do you get onto that? Make sure you have a Code School account. So go on to Code School if you haven't recently, sign up for a Code School account that'll get you on our mailing list. And then as soon as we have spaces open for free weekend, you'll get an email, you can sign up for that and then you can come and learn for free. So that's not like a free month of learning, but it is two free days over that weekend. Learn anything you want. It's the best I can do. Take it or leave it. Are uh, you still using Ruby on Rails? Uh, man, I wish I could say I was coding a lot still. Um, it's, I mean, I still learn here and there. I still learn coding stuff because I have to prove people's uh, not that I have to, I get to. I get to proof people's slides. And um, I'm working on, uh, you know, occasionally I try to do my own course stuff. Um, I wish I was coding more. Um, these days, I've been learning a lot about JavaScript. So I, am I still using Ruby on Rails? No. The other day, I did a Sinatra project. Um, I'm having some fun wiring up my uh, home, doing some home automation stuff with Ruby, where I have, um, so I've got, uh, what did I do? So I've got Amazon's uh, Echo, right? So I can say Amazon Echo trigger kitchen lights. And it's a little bit, so it goes from the trigger keyword goes to if this, then that, which then triggers a URL on a um, Sinatra app, goes to a URL on Sinatra app that I programmed, which then telnets into my Lutron you know, lighting system in my house and then turns on the lights. Um, so that, I got to program some uh, Sinatra recently, and that was a lot of fun. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I initially tried to do it in Python. I'm like, this is going to be a great Python learning experience. And I just I just had a bad time of it. Um, I, it was the Python 
Telnet library in general just did not work intuitively out of the box. And then I switched over back to Ruby and it just worked and it was intuitive. And I'm like, oh my God, I forgot, I love Ruby. Um, it was amazing. Um, have you considered adding a branch of code school that pairs local developers up to learn together? You know, at some point in time, we thought about doing like a code school local thing, and it didn't really work out. Um, our business model, because you know, we're just we're so B two C, right? B two C. We don't have a ton of money to spend on um, individual developers. When you think about it, if you get into business, right? So when you take lifetime value into account, like how much money can we afford to spend per developer? You kind of have to, you know, with a limited marketing team, with a limited marketing budget, you have to spend your money on things that are going to get in front of lots of users, right? Not like a group of 30 users, you know, you know, to win their hearts and minds. It's a little rough. So we really, you know, right now we're not really focused too much locally. But um, but sure, you know, if if you run a local group and you want to go through, you know, uh, a certain code school course together, please reach out and we'll give you, you know, some free accounts to go and do that. We'll give you some free time to go and do that so that you can or just, you know, do a free weekend. Um, all right. Next up. Um, if have you had any people learn to program through code school and eventually come back and work as a developer at code school? Um, I would say there's people who started learning like Rails through code school and then eventually came back to work as a developer. I wouldn't say like learn to program through code school because, you know, I like we're we got a lot of courses, a lot of topics, but like the idea that we could give you the same education you're going to get from a university is just, you know, false. I'm not going to tell you that you can become a programmer at code school. Because like I said, you can't just use code school to become and then all of you know, the same as four-year college, it's not going to work. So, um, uh, but there's a lot of people here that learned about code school um, through taking some of our courses and then became a developer here and love the way we teach. Uh, we got one more minute left. Okay, uh, quick, tell us please how are you going to do? How do you think is React JS going to be a leader in front of the world? Will you make a lesson about your code school? We're working on a React course. I'm not too sure which month it's going to come out, the next few months, but we are working on a React course. Um, and uh, I just proofed it, so probably in the next few months. It's really cool. Maybe it's time to create Android application for Code School. Ah, that'd be good. Yes, I, I, I approve that. Um, let us speak loudly, speak at Code, at code School, um, and talk about how you would use it, definitely. How do we hire? Uh, well, we. Uh, you have to apply for a job here. Um, look for jobs. Anybody can apply for jobs here. Um, come to the, uh, if you're local, come to the Ruby users group. We do try to hire local, which is, means we're here in Orlando because we have a ton of fun here with our culture and um, we feel like we create a family culture here. We care about our people. And if you're, you know, it's kind of hard doing the remote thing. We rarely bring on remote people because they kind of miss out on some of the um, culture stuff we do here. So you're going to have to be in Orlando. Um, come to the Ruby users group, meet our team, come get involved with the tech community and make friends so that when we know we have a job opening, we go, oh yeah, there's this guy, Jim, who I met at the Ruby users group and he's looking for a job and then you'll be on our radar. Intro songs, kudos for intro songs. Oh my God, that just warms my heart. I, this might be a good, we're at two o'clock, that might be a good question to end on. I love the jingles and some people actually don't like them. Some people say they're distracting, but I think they are a key part of what makes Code School great because they get stuck in your head. And I still end up, uh, I still end up writing a lot of them um, a lot of the time because I just somehow can rhyme um, and I keep them short. And it's really fun to like rhyme with really complex tech uh, technical words. Um, that's fun. Uh, I think should should we end there? So yeah, we can I, go. You know, what we could do is if you have just a few more minutes, Greg, we can have people ask you questions privately through the Hangout as we go off the air. Is okay, that yeah? Doing? Am I going to still be on video or is it yeah, just text? Yeah, and you'll see them on video too. So it's the first ten people to join the Hangout when I paste the link into the chat system. So oh. Greg, really want to thank you. Yeah. For participating here, it was great learning from you. And if you enjoyed Greg's message today, please consider making a donation to our coding nonprofits. There's a button in your user interface to do that right now. 
this is a free event. You know, we hope that you'll uh, repay the nonprofits and 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 you know, as as a thank you for all the speakers who have taken out the time to be here with you today. So so thanks again, Greg. Great conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, Code School Free Weekend. Don't forget, tell all your friends. Free free learning on Code School, March fifth and sixth. Sign up for a Code School account. We'll let you know. You heard it right here. Okay, guys. Talk to you soon. We'll be back right now with Nathan Mars, who's going to give a great fireside chat, and you won't want to miss it, so I'll be right back.